yippee skippy. Um, after the exam, we'll just take the exam and then you're free to go. So that'll be good. So we're going to go over neurologic and sensory deficits. So what's kind of um, nice about this is there's several different things that we're going to look at. But why isn't this dancing? Here's the objectives. Um, there's a lot of different uh, diseases that we'll look at. And they all kind of start in a different place or maybe they affect something slightly different, but they have a lot of the same um, sort of manifestations that'll affect the patient in similar ways. So a lot of dexterity, you can imagine if it's the central nervous system that's being affected in like motor um, coordination, dexterity, um, you know, shaking, weakness, so there's going to be, there's a lot of overlap. And then they might take medications that um, are for tremors or epilepsy, or, you know, so there's a lot of like possibly zero stoma, gingival, um, gingival um, hyperplasia or overgrowth. So there's not a lot of variation in like talking about each one of these. And I don't go super duper heavy into like the etiology of it. You don't have to memorize, you know, like, particularly what is happening with each uh, disease and why it's happening. I mean, having kind of a good overview is nice, um, but that kind of makes it kind of more, you can kind of lump all these a little bit kind of together in that way, because they all sort of have similar clinical manifestations. So we'll start with Parkinson's. So the cardinal manifestations, remember we talked about like the cardinal manifestations for diabetes. Cardinal, these are some of the most, com these are the, the common things that you'll see. Uh, patients have sort of a rigidity or they just have a um, tightness to their walk. It changes their gait. They have sort of a shuffling. They're not just, you know, as like relaxed. It just, these are more rigid. There's tremoring. You can notice it maybe in the hands, even like when they open their mouth, there could be tremoring like in the tongue. Um, Ankinesia is impaired muscle movement. So you can, Ankinesia or uh, bradykinesia is um, just impaired movement or slow movement. And so this affects several parts of the body. So it leads to an expressionless face that they call sometimes mask face. You remember that term because people, they love to put that on like boards, like who, what, what disease, um, you know, can be characterized by a mask face, you know, so that's sort of one of those things that has been on the boards before. So it leads to expressionless face, infrequent blinking, um, posture and gait disturbances, um, characteristics such as uh, rapid short shuffling steps. So there's just not a lot of fluidity. And then other symptoms include a low audible monotone voice and a progressive difficulty with writing, as you can imagine, there's muscle and coordination um, difficulty. So my grandma had sort of a Parkinson's-like uh, disease and um, she had a great sense of humor about, and I think that's how she handled some of the anxiety of it too. But she always said that she sounded kind of like she had too many, you know, like one too many drinks or something because she kind of made her slur a little bit. And so her talk was kind of a low monotone, but she had a bit of a slur and she didn't have specifically Parkinson's, but it was um, in the family of Parkinson's is what they sort of explained it to us as it. And um, so with Parkinson's, it's a chronic progressive disorder of the motor systems resulting from a loss of dopamine producing neurons. So you guys remember this when we were talking about uh, dopamine in oral med. So what is the um, disorder that uh, people have in excess of dopamine? Remember? Schizophrenia. schizophrenia. And then what can happen to them when they try and treat the schizophrenia? Parkinson's-like symptoms, right? Exactly. So um, that kind of we'll link it together there. So they are experiencing a loss of dopamine producing neurons. The risk factor is age, genetic susceptibility, environmental triggers, typically older people over 60. A deficit of dopamine interferes with conduction of nerve impulse. Um, related to muscle activity. And then depression is common. Dementia can be present as well. So the oral manifestations um, that you'd see with the mask, so the lack of facial expression and animation, um, tremors in the tongue, lips, neck. So this is kind of like an involuntary shaking. 
dysphagia, so difficulty obviously swallowing, handling fluids um, could be a thing. Drooling, not being able to, um, you know, the saliva might just pool in the floor of the mouth, not being able to handle the saliva. Um, pocketing food, food accumulation. My, my, I remember my grandma used to always express a concern that one day she was going to choke to death that stressed her out. So that's kind of a real um, risk there. And then uh, xerostomia due to medications, burning mouth syndrome. They can have a pulsating burning pain in the anterior portion of the tongue, um, hard palate lips and alve alveolar ridge. So something neurological happening there. I'm not sure what precisely that connection is. Um, grandma never expressed having that, um, but talking with other Parkinson's patients, it um, could be something that just some people experience and some don't. So there's something that they call the tra um, trap to kind of rem um, remind yourself what uh, the sort of those cardinal um, manifestations are, the tremors, rigidity, um, ankinesia, and the posture and balance trap. So our, for our considerations, there's um, involuntary muscle movement can be slight or severe depending on how long they've had Parkinson's, if their medications are kind of taking. You have, there's some really interesting videos with um, Michael J. Fox. Have you guys, have I, did I show you that in oral med? Maybe you did, I, I don't remember. I, but when he's moving, he's got more control. So like when he's like going and doing something, he, he loses his like shaking or his, you know, but if he's just trying to do something real fine or he's just sitting there, you can see the, the shaking. So, it, and you know, and of course it's gonna depend on how severe um, and how well the medications control their symptoms. And then um, sometimes if it's severe enough, they might have to be put under sedation um, in order to have treatment done. Orthostatic hypotension, dizziness, low blood pressure from medications potentially. Caution when adjusting the dental chair to just be aware of um, their control over their body and if they get lightheaded and then ca use caution when using fluids like just rinsing out their mouth or using the cabochon. And then um, just helping them with the issues of dexterity. This is gonna just be a repeated uh, thing for everyone that we talk about just assessing their dexterity, assessing how tight their strong their grip is, um, coming up with some solutions for them to use different, uh, different devices, um, increase the caregiver involvement. So if they, if, if they still wanna do stuff on their own, but you're noticing they really can't handle it, then involve their caregiver a little bit more. And then you guys are familiar with all these other things. Oh, sorry, I, there's a chat, what's the chat? Are we just saying hi? Okay, she's like, no, 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 I'm fine. Okay, um, cerebral palsy. So it is a, a group of chronic non-progressive neuromuscular disorders. And this typically happens, um, typically, well, it can happen, um, I suppose, during the birthing process also, but it's um, usually um, some kind of damage um, in the immature brain, like as the baby during uh, development in utero still. So affects posture and movement, most common neurological impairment of childhood. It's typically caused by like brain damage, uh, premature babies, injury during birth, um, if there's maternal infection. So if mom has something that she has to deal with during the pregnancy, toxic substances, um, and then after birth meningitis or head trauma as well. So some kind of um, trauma to the brain. Um, and then therapy and treatment for cerebral palsy can be um, physical or occupational therapy, speech and language um, therapy, biofeedback, which is um, sort of teaching an alternative means of um, teaching, like teaching the body how to do something using a different, a different uh, pathway, basically. And so it's non-medicine. And then orthopedic devices, usually to kind of stretch out, keep ligaments stretched out and keep them from sort of curling in and tightening in. Medications, Botox, that also that would be for like relaxation, obviously. Valium, um, dantrium, and gabapentin. And then main cause of death is respiratory or cardiac failure or heart disease. So most oral... Um, 
clinical findings in patients with cerebral palsy are related to um, disturbances of the oral musculature. So I didn't put, for, I didn't really put any pictures up. Um, I probably should have though, because there's a lot that happens with their muscles and their tongue. So there, if you know, if you look through pictures, like if you Google and you look through pictures of like kids with cerebral palsy, a lot of them have like a, like a class two occlusion or like a narrow palate with, um, you know, like the kind of the bucky teeth. And the reason for that is because they have a lot of variation in their facial muscle and, and um, tongue thrusting. So there's a constant pressure on the back of their maxillary teeth from their tongue and it's going to push their teeth out. So they can have difficulty clearing food if um, seizures, are, seizures are present. Um, they may have to take something like an anticonvulsant, which can of course lead to gingival overgrowth. Anterior teeth fractures, if there's like falls, if they um, uh, trip and fall or, you know, something or have a seizure and have, a, um, have trauma to their mouth. Attrition, bruxism, enamel hypoplasia can be present, malocclusion, drooling, um, faulty swallowing, and then the tongue thrusting. So I had some notes here. I just want to see what is not, I did repeat here. Um, the teeth of children with congenital um, cerebral palsy may exhibit enamel hypoplasia. So that might be more like of an in utero as opposed to like brain damage, up, you know, after uh, birth. And then this enamel defect may be related to the stage of tooth development during the time of the cerebral injury. So like say mom had a severe infection or something like that, that could affect the enamel development while baby was inside. Malocclusion commonly results from the abnormal functioning of the facial and masticatory and lingual musculature in conjunction with oral habits such as tongue thrusting, mouth breathing, and faulty swallowing, drooling caused by dysphagia and hypotonic lip muscle, lip muscles frequently is observed. So there's just a lot of different stuff happening with their facial muscles that can um, cause these different oral manifestations. So our consideration, so involuntary muscle movement, so that can be a safety issue if their uh, arms are like flailing or moving around. So they have to be sort of tucked down on the patient's chest, keep head supported and flex. There can be a lot of uh, just tightness in the shoulders and the neck. Um, so keeping like a, you know, their head supported with like a pillow or towel tucked behind. Um, there may be somebody might need to support their head as well. And then um, sometimes the chair might need to be kept in a more upright position. It's just going to depend. You might have to do the cleaning in the wheel. If a patient's in a wheelchair, they may have to um, do it uh, in, a, in a wheelchair. And then hands folded at the midline just for safety. And then massaging the shoulders. So if they get real rigid and tight, um, then maybe just having either the caregiver or yourself kind of give them a massage to try and help relax the muscles in their shoulders. Typically significant dexterity issues. So we have to, again, think about like, you know, maybe a strap, um, the toothbrush that gets strapped to the hand or something like this, because there might not be the ability to close and hold the handle. Um, floss handle may be needed, electric toothbrush, and then all of these repetitive things that we think about, fluoride, fluorhexidine, saliva substitutes. Always think about with anybody, depending on the severity of whatever it is, whether it's a patient with dementia or a child with cerebral palsy, depending on the severity of their situation, always think about reinforcing all of your information with the caregiver. That's just kind of, that can be kind of overlaid to everybody who has a significant um, health barrier. Dietary considerations and um, xylitol products. So uh, multiple sclerosis, so this is an autoimmune uh, disease of the um, central nervous system in which there is uh, the myelin sheath um, over the neuron starts to become destroyed. There's destruction of the myelin sheath of the specific axons causing multiple neurologic symptoms that occur over time. And, uh, hold on. 
So this is the this is the most common chronic and debilitating neurologic condition of younger people. So you know, 30s. Um, white women in their mid 30s tend to be the largest population. Northern European ancestry. Colder and um, temperate climates, higher latitude. So I was I've been doing research on latitude for um, a class I'm doing on immunity and vitamins, and so it's um, it's just super important. I'm just going to tell you all right now, if you're not taking vitamin D, take vitamin D. Um, because it's super important if we're not, if we live um, above the 35th latitude, <laughs> were you going to try, what were you going to say? But that's crazy. Isn't that amazing? Just more I think there are so many things that vitamin D deficiency is affecting and our public health people are not sharing it with human beings. Okay, sorry, I'm not gonna go on a tangent. Yes, go ahead. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And keep himself cold. It's interesting because one of my, I think the next slide says everybody with MS has a very different experience. Like there, there's not like a cookie cutter MS. Mm -hmm. Oh. Oh, it sounds very aggressive. His sounds like very aggressive. Oh, that's so sad. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That is. Janice, did you have your hand up? I don't know because my neighbor has fibromyalgia. That's a hard one. I feel like that one, people they they haven't always known like what to do with fibromyalgia or what where to put it. And people are like, I'm in full body pain, right? And so I feel like there's still a lot of research on that. But I don't know. I mean, I take vitamin D for that too because who knows? It could help. But I don't know that that's a deficiency. My neighbor has fibromyalgia as well, and that's been a battle for her. She also has gets migraines and or she gets lots of stuff kind of have affected her. Um, okay, so yes, going on to the next one. Nobody raised their hand over here today. Okay, um, so with, with MS or multiple sclerosis, so it's uh, genetic and environmental factors. Vitamin D deficiency is a risk factor. Um, they have shown that. Other risk factors, Epstein-Barr virus, cigarette smoking, and then like we we're saying, no two individuals with MS seem to be identical. I, I've, I've talked with people who have made dietary changes or lifestyle changes and have either slowed or eliminated their symptoms. And then like, um, you know, Kelly was saying that maybe it's very severe and there, it wouldn't change by just taking, doing some simple um, lifestyle change. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, it sounds like it's yeah more aggressive. So typically the um, unpredictable prognosis, probably because everybody is a little different, um, disease initially is sort of exasperated. You find, you kind of like, you get a first sort of strong onset where all the symptoms are come in and it's like, whoa, something's wrong. But then it can go, it can become kind of cyclical and there can be times of remission and then activity. Um, and then um, and then in general, it's just sort of like a, a slow progression. Um, but if hopefully, you know, people can figure out certain things and maybe lessen those, that progression or that chronic progression. Common medications could be um, steroids potentially or other 
um, medications, um, especially too, if there's some other kind of psychological complications like anxiety, depression that go along with it. So they're, they could be treating other things that have come up with the MS diagnosis. Um, facial pain, things that we have to be aware of, uh, facial pain, TMJ issues, um, muscular dysfunction, trigeminal neuralgia, um, feeling a pain in their face. And trigeminal neuralgia can be very, very painful. And so it can hurt to like, if it's aired, it can hurt to literally manipulate the cheek to just take an x-ray or start some kind of a procedure. So we have to be very uh, understanding about that. Um, loss of muscular coordination, dexterity, tongue and facial muscles interfere with self-cleaning mechanisms, especially if there's sort of like a weakness or a lack of control. Hyposalivation, xerostomia, gingival enlargement, all of that would depend on what kind of medications they're on. Um, I have some extra notes here that I won't read, but this is um, just highlighting the oral stuff again. They often experience facial pain, TMJ, we already talked about that, um, with pro progression of MS as the patient loses muscular coordination, oral hygiene care can become more difficult and the involvement of the tongue and facial muscles interferes with self-cleaning or uh, cleaning out the oral cavity. So they might, um, food might build up in the vestibule of that pocketing of food could become more um, common um, if they get more um, severe in the, in the disorder or the disease. So infections can result in a relapse. So if they have some kind of an infection anywhere in their body, or if they have significant oral infections, it could trigger a relapse. So that's important for our patients to understand. Frequent dental hygiene appointments to maintain health, short appointments, especially if they have a more severe case and it's hard for them to lay there and get um, kind of poked on and stuff. If temperature sensitive, again, like Kelly was saying, her cousin's really sensitive to temperature. So if um, they're temperature sensitive, make sure the room's not too hot or too cold. Um, incontinence, if that is an issue for them, be sure that you know, you've at least noted it and rem remember that you can let, you know, say if you need to use the restroom, you can get up more frequently, just let me know. Just make them feel comfortable and not embarrassed about whatever their personal situation is. Thinking about muscle weakness and how it relates to all of the things, clearing food, um, cleaning their mouth. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of crazy because that could almost like if he if he if it alleviates a lot of his symptoms and he feels more like his I was gonna say that would could like almost yeah. It's a miracle drug. Wow. Yeah, that is interesting. Are you raising your hand, Megan, or sketching? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so MS kind of, no, it's fine. It kind of comes in like um, cycles. So they might have like um, an expression of like an exacerbated um, period where the disease is really the symptoms are severe and they're and then it kind of goes into like a remission sort of and then so if they do have this where it's been in remission or the they're not progressing or the severity is not increasing something yeah mm -hmm. or some people might just notice sort of, sort of a slow chronic kind of decline but uh, a lot of people things will kind of even out and then it might get bad again for a while And like Callie said, it can also affect vision. Like her cousin saw double vision. So vision impairment can be another. Um, so same thing, saliva substitutes, xylitol, 
Um, visual aids in the office can be helpful. So especially if, you know, you just have to take your patient. This is, this is all about just like your critical thinking skills with a patient in your care. Look at what their barriers are and then think about how you can help them. Um, take home pamphlets, um, modifying your OHI. And then we always um, encourage good oral hygiene, especially for patients who have some kind of a chronic systemic condition. They need it more, they need it just as much as everybody and sometimes more, and communication. Um, so ALS or amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, also known as Lou Gehrig's disease. So this is like super scary to me. I've known a couple, two patients that had this. One of them um, wasn't a patient, it was just a family. And this can progress pretty quickly. Um, or a little bit slower, two to five years typically, but it's a progressive neurodegenerative disease that affects the cells in the nervous system, particularly motor neurons of the brain and spinal cord. And then, um, so you have, there's like a lack of nourishment of the muscles. And so they basically just like shrivel up and atrophy. Um, and so, and when you think about that, like, oh, you think, oh, well, hands and, and feet, they can't walk but it's like your ability to like then breathe, like everything that functions in your body um, just kind of withers away. And so they have a lack of muscle nourishment that leads to muscle at atrophy. Sclerosis is the scarring and the hardening of the actual neurons in the brain, the spinal cord. And then sclerosis can ultimately lead to the loss of breathing. And um, they usually die, the patient dies because they, they can't breathe. They, Ventum, and then that only lasts for so long. Yeah, Trey. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So this is crazy because when, um, oh, it's not on this one. Is it on my other one? So yes, but so when you look up Stephen Hawking, he's like, um, he was diagnosed with, uh, like they just call it kind of a neuro neuromuscular degenerative, but then other things we'll call it ALS or Lou Gehrig's, but he lived, he was only supposed to live to like 25 and he lived to be like 70 something. So, and they don't even know why. They don't know why he lived so long. Yeah, because he was like, yeah, they are just like, you can't die. Somebody was pumping him full of something probably. Right, I mean, it's just so weird that somebody that was so like integral to science, like managed to not die. But anyway, so yeah, he did. A, I have seen conflicting things though that some literally say that he had ALS and other people say it was like a type, you know? So, but um, sporadic ALS, um, there's no known cause. There's only one FDA approved medication, Relugo, uh, Relutec. Um, it's the only FDA approved and it doesn't seem to, I mean, it's not like a miracle drug. It gets it can prolong life for a couple of months, um, but it can be a very, very fast, fast moving. So I, I, I read some things where people got diagnosed and within months they passed away and then other people like maybe a two to five year span of time. So a lot of times, if you were to see a patient with ALS, you would probably see them in their mid range and then maybe palliative care. Um, often patients on many medications to deal with the various symptoms and complications that would come along with the disease. And what's so sad about this one is that their mental capacities are always there. So even though their body is like leaving them completely, they still are completely aware. And I always think that, I don't know if that's a blessing or a curse or a little bit of both, but of course there's going to be, and it was the same way with my grandma with uh, her Parkinson's, like she, she knew what could happen in the future. She knew that she could choke and, and it just causes anxiety and depression. So of course that would be probably treated with patients with ALS. Um, so life expectancy, three to five years, Stephen Hawking lived, he lived 57 years after his diagnosis, which is crazy. Muscle weakness and stiffness, uh, paralysis and wasting away, range of motion is reduced, fine motor skills, um, and then eventually they're dependent on a ventilator. That's just a very progressive degenerative disease. Um, so special considerations, of course, depending on the medications, there could be potentially a lot of uh, xerostomia. 
um, sialuria excessive saliva, they have difficulty swallowing, it might just pool. Um, and then supine or an upright position. And you know, you just, they might not, you might, if you have a patient with ALS in your chair, you probably wouldn't put them back all day, you might just tip them back a little. Um, shorter appointments, frequent breaks. I, I think the patient that I saw, they weren't very far. I've never seen anybody in my chair that was pretty far into the disease. They were still pretty um, capable of doing things. So they probably had an early diagnosis. Um, special considerations, of course, uh, choking or gagging, difficulty speaking, modified brushing techniques, um, depending on the patient's self-care abilities and the caregiver. In all stages of the disease, power toothbrushes are always good for many, many different people and situations, interdental aids, lots of preventative care, just, and mostly, you know, obviously not to say that they couldn't live a long time, but, you know, prevention of, you know, caries is important, but not necessarily, you know, it's more of that uh, palliative care, because if things get neglected in the short term, they could be in a lot of discomfort. And that's the, that's the focus of palliative care is to just relieve discomfort. So keep their mouth clean, keep their tissues moist. All of that is just to um, encourage like your optimum, you know, quality of life while you're still alive. And, okay, where am I? Why can't I? Okay, Huntington, Huntington disease, kind of an interesting one. Um, it's a rare, highly complex neurodegenerative disorder resulting from the um, degeneration of neurons within the basal ganglia, so a part of the brain kind of deep inside the brain. Um, and it can also affect the cortex of the brain, which controls many things, including uh, thought perception and then cognition and memory. So sometimes there's some, unlike some of the other ones where it's just simply like the body's movement and different parts of the body, this actually has some cognitive effect. The symptoms can include changes in personality, mood swings, and depression, as well as impaired thinking and judgment, slurred speech, dysphagia, weight loss, and um, rhea. What is that? I don't recognize that. I hate it when I notice something where I'm like, dang it. So I was going to like make sure that I know all my different things. I don't know why I have that there. Okay, I'm going to look at that when I get done. Um, so there's generally stages. No, no. That is okay. That makes sense because that's what the pictures. Thank you. So um, I didn't post any. Yeah. So there's some pictures that I was going to put. I have so many, so many, many words. I don't have a lot of room for pictures, but that was what some of the pictures um, were kind of depicting sort of a jerky motion. Thank you. That's what. Um, and then um, Huntington disease is fatal. And at present, there's no cure. Um, so that's, that's fine. And then all of a sudden it comes on. I don't know. I have to do a little more research. Do you, what do you know? Uh, yeah typically maybe it's like typical for it to come on is it after 30 mm -hmm. yeah there's a huge genetic component yeah I wanted to I always try to like make it so my slide decks aren't too um too many slides but there were some good um pictures that talk that showed some of the the muscle movements or the body motions, and then some of the genetic components. Like if your dad has this, your mom has, then this is the likelihood. Um, maybe I'll add that stuff back in. Um, so uh, of course, oral manifestations, we have xerostomia, increased caries. Um, as the disease progresses, um, difficulty with swallowing, like a lot of the ones that we've talked about, 
Um, patients could be in wheelchairs, um, positioning in a semi-supine or upright, um, limiting ultrasonics for fluid. That's, that's with a lot of them as well. Increased um, risk um, for uh, different, you know, obviously um, dental caries or perio, frequent dental visits. And then just talking about all these things with the caregiver, just like with all the other ones. So you can kind of see it's sort of like it's sort of repetitive, like all these that kind of come to the same sort of conclusion with a lot of these different um, diseases. So traumatic brain injury or post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, traumatic brain injury is caused by an external force, obviously, and results in a disruption of the normal function of the brain. Um, there can be cognitive behavioral or um, physical disabilities and then psychiatric disorders, including post-traumatic stress disorder can occur. So if there's something really dramatic happens or really stressful happens, then there can be that post-traumatic stress after the fact that can accompany it. If it was like a violent, some kind of a violent episode or accident, that was you know, something just really um, major in their life that then caused the injury. So with this, it's just going to depend on the injury, the severity of the injury, the patient and their, you know, how it's affected their life. So this has a wide range of possibilities, um, you know, depending on medications, of course, there could be xerostomia, assisting them with emotional stability, partnering with other um, healthcare providers. So if it's a you know, if it's some kind of a trigger for them to come into the dental office, then maybe, you know, figuring out a plan to help them come in and make the appointment as calm and reassuring as possible, involve other family members and caregivers in the treatment plan, and then, and then remind, you know, talking to them about the importance of um, oral hygiene. A lot of times family members can, they can almost, you know, it's like they know things like, well, of course they need help going to the bathroom. And of course they need to take a shower, but they can leave out the mouth. Like it's not even like a part of the body. Or sometimes I think people think, oh, they're eating food. So eating will somehow cleanse the mouth. Like I really think some people just can't think beyond that. And, and, you know, like I'll give them a carrot and that should brush their teeth. Right. You know, like they, they don't think beyond what like actually happens and how things stick. So it's just so important to, you know, especially if somebody is dealing with a high stress caregiving kind of situation or somebody with like in, uh, behavioral or emotional that's very stressful, that could be that much harder to add that kind of uh, thing to their regimen. It's just a lot of sympathy and empathy and then education. So specific protocols for patient management depends on the extent of the injury and the therapist involved. Non-pharmacological treatments for um, PTSD includes cognitive behavioral therapy, prolonged exposure therapy. So if it's like, like I said, if it's like a trigger, it's hard for them. Sometimes just little, like little appointments to just kind of um, expose them and let them get used to it. Prescribed drugs, antidepressant, antipsychotics, sedatives, hypnotics, different things um, could be available to them. Spinal cord injuries. So I just put up a little picture here with the um, where the injury could be, and then the corresponding um, tetraplegic, paraplegic. <clears throat> so this is going to affect motor and sensory, um, or one or both, and then causes injury or trauma. Um, it can be caused by injury, or trauma, or disease. The highest population would be young males, because if it's a physical injury, probably because they're like you know, BMX biking or dirt biking or jumping out of an airplane or, you know, snowboarding or doing something like that. And then symptoms vary depending on um, level and then the type of the trauma. So where the injury is in the spine, there's physical therapy, counseling, they could be involved with several, you know, many different um, healthcare providers, ventilators, um, place individuals at risk of pneumonia. So if they're, you know, if it's way up here in the sea, region and they need, they're on a breathing machine and that kind of puts them into a whole new level <clears throat> of care. And then pressure sores is a major concern. You know, they have to um, be kind of rotated so that they don't um, get a pressure sore on one side of their body. 
Um, so if it, if it is someone who's bedridden, this is gonna look very different from somebody who just may be paralyzed from like the waist down and they can come into the office. Oh, wow. Yeah. They can talk. Yeah. Was it trach? Did they? Yeah. yeah. That would make oral care like that would that's good because that kind of gets that out of the way. Yeah, they were all. Uh, that was a whole other wow. It was really scary because like. Wow. And so literally, I have to be like, okay. Their breathing machine. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So literally, I have like thirty seconds to like. To get it right. That is a lot of pressure. That was in Oregon? Yeah. In Portland? In Beaverton? That is so interesting. Yeah, and then we had an empty bag like right there because like it's really dangerous. Somebody had to like give them some oxygen. Oh my gosh, that's crazy. That is stressful. <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm sure it's stressed ahead a little. <clears throat> I'm very froggy at the moment. All of a sudden, like a frog jumped into my throat. <clears throat> I know I should. Oh, let's take a break. <laughs> what a great time to take a break. <clears throat> okay, let's take a five minute break. <clears throat> And they were on trachs and they had MS. <clears throat> I wonder why, if that came after, did the MS come after the injury? <clears throat> yeah, that's really interesting though. I'm gonna pause the recording, but someone remind me to unpause it. It's not. That is being froggy is not on the data. I have a frog in my throat. That's just what I call it. Okay. So I resumed recording. So spinal cord injury. Um can where did I did I have an earlier one? Obviously, this can go along with the traumatic um injury is oh no that's too far and this will oh yeah we talked about how it depends on where the injury was so one thing that somebody may have is something called a mouth um mouth held appliance or mouth stick and they um just it's you know like a mouth guard or like usually hard acrylic so that it's more stable and they bite on it and they can have all sorts of different um, different types of appliances attached to it. So it could be just a pointer, like if they um, have a speaking, assistive, like kind of speaking device where they could push on the alphabet or pictures or um, with their computer, like a touch screen. Um, they can, I saw some images of people drawing and painting and having a paintbrush. So all kinds of different things. But of course, they'd have to know about potential for chipping their teeth or um, cleansing it, you know, making sure it doesn't build up with plaque and calculus and whatnot. So you'd have to um, give them some instruction there. Um, and then um, and then all the other things just sort of fall in line, oral hygiene adapted to their specific needs, um, and then sharing the instructions with the caregiver. So this is a pretty good video here for um, seizures or for epilepsy. I think it's like five minutes, so I won't play it, but um, I'd recommend because it shows somebody in a hospital bed kind of so, kind of going into a tonic clonic seizure and um, or a grand mal seizure. And so it's just kind of interesting to kind of see how it how it visually looks and then kind of how they kind of sort of come out of it. So it's a brief disturbance of cerebral function, typically less than two minutes caused by the um, central nervous system dysfunction oftentimes with an unknown origin. Um, epilepsy is a seizure disorder. Types of seizures, uh, we talked about this a little bit in oral med, so just kind of a recap. There's the grand mal or the petite mal. 
and then status ellipticus, which is the one that can keep going and they need to actually seek medical um, medical attention for that. And then we know that the dilantin medications can cause gingival overgrowth and then cannabis can also be, I just added that after you guys talked about it because we know that they can get some relief from cannabis use. They have um, prescription for that. And then, um, oh yes, I had, I have a little side note. I said, mention patient. Okay, so I had this patient when I was um, seeing patients at a senior center, she came in and she wasn't, uh, she wasn't a senior. She was like in her forties, but she told me that she, um, and this is just anecdotally interesting. I, there, I, there's, I never read any studies on it, but she told me that she was having like something like nine seizures a day. And then she went on a ketogenic diet and they all went away. And I just thought, well, that's just the craziest thing. And I think I put that note in there because I wanted to like research it and then I forgot and I never did. So that reminds me that that happened. But yeah, she had totally changed her diet and it had um, very significantly affected her number of seizures that she had. So there's sort of a new classification for seizures. Um, uh, and so they call them either focal or generalized and then motor or non-motor. So focal is sort of, you can kind of think about it like being like focused sort of in like one part of the brain or general, like affecting more of the brain. Um, and then uh, motor obviously is kind of self-explanatory mm -hmm. and then non-motor would be just sort of like that sort of absent, they're not really there. It's the, and they might just be sitting and staring and you're like, hello, and then they come and are, have awareness again. So that's sort of um, affecting that that part of their brain that they're just maybe kind of spaced out for a minute. So focal means a part of the brain where generalized refers to the whole brain, motor refers to um, things like muscle weakness, the twitching, and non-motor refers to uh, staring spells with or without the twitching, emotional sensations, changes in auto, um, autonomic functions. So that's sort of the way they've sort of uh, um, classified it more recently. So patients who experience seizures could have uh, mouth trauma. They could have scars from biting their lips or cheeks or tongue. They could have lacerations from falling, fractured teeth, and of course the gingival overgrowth from the medication. Uh, the better their oral hygiene is, we know that that can help reduce some of that. So it's important that they um, keep up on their oral hygiene if they're on uh, that kind of a medication. Prevention of seizures in the dental chair, just kind of talk to them about their, how often they have seizures, what triggers them. You just sort of want to know, is this something that could happen while you're in the office? You just kind of want to get a ballpark. So is it a good day to have dental care? Have you had any of those feelings like something could, you know, sometimes they have an, an aura or a feeling like something um, could, could happen. Avoid nitrous oxide because that is um, contraindicated for epilepsy. Early morning appointments, um, just that same thing. Being stressed and fatigued is just not good for anybody with a chronic condition, and it can trigger a seizure if they're tired or stressed out. Management of seizures, if they do occur, we just basically want to prevent them from injuring themselves. So you just kind of support their body as they move. Um, don't try to move them out of the chair onto the floor. Just let them be there and just have somebody come and they'll and just sort of try and protect them um, from you know falling out or hitting themselves or something. And of course, maintain the airway. And then um, based on the frequency and the severity of the gingival hyperplasia, it you know sometimes they might actually do something like trim away some of the gingiva, maybe do a laser treatment um, or just if it's not too severe, they might just try and you know encourage extra oral hygiene. So it just kind of depends on the severity of it. Um, okay. So here's just some more overview of oral hygiene habits, some products they can use. Um, oral hygiene habits makes a huge difference with the gingival hyperplasia. So that 
kind of putting some of that in so that they know that it's not, well, it's just because you take this medicine and nothing's going to make it better. Like giving them a little ownership on how, um, how good their oral hygiene is will have an effect on that re um, reaction if they have that side effect. And just, I think that's all. It, so then peripheral neuropathies, um, they're conditions that develop as a result of damage to the peripheral nervous system. So patients like diabetic patients might experience peripheral neuropathies. Um, it's due to the damage of the axons or to the myelin sheath around the axons, which distorts the signals between the central nervous system and the rest of the body. So patients could experience things such as muscle weakness, twitching, atrophy, decreased um, reflexes, and then there's sensory nerve damage that can um, um, cause like a numbness or tingling, the pins and needles. Um, they could have an inability to feel pain. They can lose a sensation. Uh, diabetic patients get that a lot in their feet. It may also result in temperature sensations, uncoordinated movements, um, imbalance, sensations of imbalance. They can't feel everything as sensitively as they used to be able to. Um, so sensory nerve damage can cause um, pain. And then the pain can be hard to treat too. Um, you know, it's, it's hard to just put somebody on a, a steroid forever because they're, you know, so sometimes um, there's pain management specialists that can try different things. But this is just kind of going over the same. They can have burning, it can be burning, jabbing, feel like a tight rubber band, pressure, cold. Um, and then it can be associated with long-term alcoholism, diabetes, HIV, or infection. So one example that is um, sometimes unknown, or it can be connected with a virus, um, is Bell's palsy. And so that's the most common facial paralysis. It's um, affecting the facial nerve, cranial nerve seven, inflamed or compressed, or then there's that, you know, um, connection with like possibly like a virus can trigger it, um, but there's communication interruption on that vein, I mean on that nerve, and this can occur at any age. Um, there is a little bit more of a um, occurrence of patients um, that have diabetes or upper respiratory ailments. Um, or, and it can also be caused um, iatrogenically. So if it can be caused by a doctor or a hygienist given local anesthetic. So it can, uh -huh. if, you know, something gets irritated basically and that, that nerve gets irritated. Yeah. Did you, is that what they said? Does that, so it's stress induced? Yeah, they said that stress can trigger the virus. Yeah. 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 There's so many viruses that we, that affect us like kids viruses, for example, like my girls have gotten, you know, like funny rashes and they, they have no other symptoms at all other than like, uh, you know, it's like roseola or, but there's, but then the pediatrician is like, there's a ton of different viruses that they just get and they might, they're running around eating, acting like normal, healthy kids. And then all of a sudden there's like a, you know, some great, so you, a virus could run its course and you might not feel it. And then you get, and then with the, on top of the stress. So that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. My girls have had a couple, I just remember Rosella was one of the names, but there was another one they had. Katie had one in Arizona. I can't remember. I'll just say at the end, but I have got this, it, it's crazy, the photos are insane. His, uh, like a rash. It, it started on his hand, it was like a little tiny, like blister, I thought he burned. Yeah. But he didn't. No. And. It wasn't hand, foot, and mouth? No. It wasn't. It was insane, like I'll show you what I Yeah. Said. I wish I could. Put it up on. <laughs> no, I'm not kidding. And it just thought, I, I was really concerned, and he was like, oh, my hand hurts, my hand hurts. He took him to the doctor, and they were like, oh. You know, it's okay. It literally started growing. Like I was, it was like his whole thing. Kind of like, kind of like, but because it started eating his skin, <gasps> and it just started growing and growing. And 
was like a gigantic blister. Oh. And I have no idea where it came from. And it was the craziest thing. Then we got to the staff and all. Yeah. That well, that's what you'd be afraid of. Yeah, like some bacterial infection on top yeah, of it. Yeah, it was insane. I mean, and he was like, he was like four. Oh. He was like four. So, you know, he did pretty good about not messing with it. But we had to wrap it for a long time because. Oh. I mean, literally, it was just a whole layer of pins, and, <gasps> and it went wrapped around his forehead. It was, it was oh, that's scary. Yeah. Um. Okay. So with Bell, Bell's palsy, there's not a lot. Did they give you any? They didn't give you anything, right? Like, yeah, no. I don't have a steroid. Oh, they did give yeah, you a steroid. They gave me some things to see where exactly what it was, and then I think it was something on antiviral. And a steroid. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Oh, I oh look at that steroids and antiviral agents. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. Okay, and then and I remember like your uh, it, you were yours wasn't so bad after it was bad for like a couple days. No, it was. I, I don't had, remember. I'm like, I had to take my eyes out for like did you? Oh, seriously, months. or was it dry out? Well, it just wouldn't shut. Yeah. So my eye would like dry out at yeah. night. So I had to keep it. Yeah. Just keep it. Crazy. <laughs> You're like, oh, this is fun. Okay. But most people fully recover. It takes a while. Which we can see there. Okay. Difficult. So things that they might, um, especially like if you have them in their chair, one thing, um, patients won't really think about is the difficulty of cleansing that area as well because they might not feel um you know the toothbrush as well or they just might everything just is because it's going to be um more relaxed on that side anecdotal stories of that well i would say like another thing that i have to do is like anything that's like more of a Oh, it was like it was like super sore from not moving for a while. Yeah. And like, like I was like trying to move it for so mm -hmm. long that it was just like putting a lot. And then of all the chewing and it eating. Hurt so bad. Interesting. But no. Um. It wasn't a stroke. That's all. I and it was not, it was a, not stroke. a stroke. So um, patients can also have to caution them about, you know, getting their cheek or their lip or their tongue caught and chewing or causing like uh, trauma, kind of similar, like when you have that local anesthetic and we try and get kids not to play with their numb side of their cheek and lip and tongue, they can create a sore. So difficulty clearing food, difficulty um, cleansing that side of the face, um, protective eyewear, and then um, and then we already talked about that, adapt to impaired musculature. And then here are just some review of some oral hygiene, may not brush as well due to numbness, establish a pattern. So we might kind of give them some ideas of how to, you know, watch yourself in the mirror when you're actually doing your oral hygiene routine so that you can actually see where you're accessing and or establish a pattern in case you forgot that you didn't hit that part of your mouth because you don't feel it as well and then rinse with water after eating. They might not feel if something gets stuck or something. And so kind of cleansing just to swish with some water might be helpful. Um, and then trigeminal neuralgia. So this is mono um, neuropathy of the trigeminal nerve, cranial nerve five. This can be very painful. Um, this can affect women, older women, uh, over 40s. The patients that I have seen have been more in their like 60s plus. Um, who've had this. Um, it's also observed in patients with MS, like we talked about a minute, a couple minutes ago. Family history with vascular abnormalities is a possibility. So there's some like compression. Sometimes they can do a surgery to try and relieve the compression if it's just sort of a functional, the way your body is made kind of a thing, or there could be things like a tumor um, or nerve compression that has happened over time. That's why it didn't affect you know, the person when they were younger. So this is just a picture of um, where the surgery might take place here. Here's um, 
the nerve and then they put in these little sponge blocks to pull, to pull off this artery, these arteries that are putting pressure on the, on the trigeminal nerve. So they put in, um, they may have to do a little like reconstruction or something. So there's also drug therapy, anticonvulsants, tricyclic antidepressants. I think they didn't always, it can be very difficult to uh, pinpoint what this is. Um, patients can talk about having pain and then they're taking x-rays and trying to figure out what it is. And diagnosis can, can take a while and it can be very frustrating because the dentist is like, I don't see anything. You don't have any, you don't need any root canals. I don't see, everything looks great. And it's very frustrating because the patient is be like, I am in, in incredible pain. And then they send them to their physician and the physician doesn't know. So this, it can be a very frustrating um, for patients to get this diagnosis. Um, let's see, oral manifestations, oral ulcerations or serostoma due to medications, avoidance due to fear of triggering the pain. So if patient, like the, this one woman that I remember seeing not too many years ago, she came in and she was like, I don't really want to be here. Just, you know, like when you get over onto this side, just be very slow. And, and I was like, if you feel anything, we can stop. But the problem is, is if you trigger it, like, even if you're really careful to move the cheek and if it triggers, it's almost like it's been triggered, you know, it's doesn't, it's, you can't do, once you started it, you've started it. So thankfully nothing happened during that appointment. I was happy about that, but it was like, she'd had a period of about a week where she had been in pain and then it went away. And so, and we didn't trigger it. So that was good. Um, but they can have biofilm related diseases if they're trying to avoid triggering the pain. So empathy is real important, especially if you don't see anything telling patients like, well, I don't see anything. Everything looks great to me. It's like they, that's almost code for, I don't know what your problem is, or I don't believe you. And so it's like, you know, it can be hard as a clinician too, because if we don't see a big cavity or an abscess on, you know, it, it can be hard. Um, but a definitive diagnosis could take time, can be frustrating. A full supine may actually reduce pressure. So if they lay all the way back, that can actually help as opposed to being up. Um, and then you can relieve pain with the local anesthetic sometimes too. You can get, um, you can numb that area. Short appointments, referral to, you know, a physician or an oral surgeon or um, whoever may handle that kind of further diagnosis. And then individualized care, talk to client about specific difficulties. Again, it could just depend on what the patient's dealing with. Um, let's see, it's well established that distinguishing trigeminal neuralgia from odontogenic pain is challenging. So that's kind of in the literature that it, it just takes a while and it can be hard to get that, that diagnosis. Triggering an... Yeah, like triggering an episode of the pain cause, like irritating the nerve, like the minute the nerve starts to get irritated, it's just, then they're just into this like full-blown pain that can last days or, you know, like a week or more. So um, dementia and Alzheimer's, um, this is a progressive intellectual decline that eventually leads to deterioration um, in all these different areas, occupational, social, uh, interper interpersonal, and eventually um, it, there's stages. So, you know, it kind of just sort of gets worse with the stages. It results from a death of nerve cells and a loss of communication among these cells. And Alzheimer's, you guys remember the plaques and tangles? Remember we talked about that in um, oral med? So it's sort of a buildup, um, amyloid plaques, abnormal clumps of beta amyloid proteins, and degenerated degenerating neurons and other cells, contributing to the um, destruction of the neurons and atrophy of the cerebral cortex. So major risk factors are age and genetics, family history, but risk factors also include diabetes, Down syndrome, um, hypoxia and um, anoxia and brain tumors, trauma, toxins, and medication. So there's various ones, but the main ones are probably uh, family history but they are kind of talking about diabetes or um, Alzheimer's and dementia is like type three diabetes. I don't know if anybody's seen that um, there's research and there's just things in that area where they're kind of um, almost calling it like a type three diabetes. I think it's because of the, um, those plaques and tangles. 
But um, so here's a little bit about the stages. So there's early stage and as the um, disease progresses. So it's just kind of going in. Oh, sorry, I'm over here. So um, it's just kind of talking a little bit about what you might see with your patient in an early stage versus kind of a, a moderate and then severe. And then it, the progressive, there's intellectual decline leading to deterioration of these um, areas that we mentioned already, um, rising in frequency with age and it's a result of the death of the nerve cells, which we have, that's kind of a repetitive slide. Um, so 65 and over, so um, it's a form of dementia, but 65 and over, 10% um, of 65 and overs have um, Alzheimer's and 85 years and over 50% have some form of dementia. So I don't know if they specifically have Alzheimer's, but they have some form of dementia. And then um, the, the already, I think this is repeating it again. Yes, these are just repetitive. I actually dragged some of these over from, um, from another slide deck and I think they're just all kind of repeating themselves. So early stage, and then as it progresses. So with this, just with, with anything, if a patient is in a more severe stage, they're gonna need more um, uh, counseling on their oral hygiene, their diet, involving the caregiver more. Um, so again, it's just gonna depend on where they're at. If they just have mild forgetfulness or a mild stage, then you still sort of have to rely on the caregiver. You can, you know, or, but if they're, if they're still pretty with it, you can give them little recommendations like set a timer on your phone or put a big red sticky note on your bathroom mirror that says, did you brush your teeth this morning? And you know, like you can give them things to kind of use if they're in the early stage, but you're gonna wanna in, um, include the caregiver. Giving simple instructions, educating the caregiver and having patience with the patient um, with their situation. Don't put too many things on them, keep it pretty simple. And then um, patients tend to forget to brush. They, you know, tend to not use any of their oral care. So they're going to have a higher rate of caries and periodontal disease. Um, loss of appetite may be a sign of mouth pain if they're dentures. So if they're in a more advanced um, Alzheimer's situation or dementia, they might have a pain in their mouth, but they might not be able to express that. So if they've done something like they've altered some kind of a regular routine or they stopped eating, that could be a clue that something more serious is going on. And then um, some techniques for patients trying to get them to um, learn a skill or improve on you know, an oral hygiene. You can use terms like you can say, watch me, and then you can show them what you want them to do. Something simple like with brushing, um, not so much with something that takes more dexterity and more complicated oral hygiene um, practice, but something simple like brushing offering both the patient and the caregiver home care items and demonstrating proper oral care techniques. So always including the caregiver, like we have already mentioned. So um, with a stroke or cerebral vascular accident, um, it's an interruption of oxygen oxygenated blood to the brain. You can have the um, ischemic or the hemorrhagic. Thank you, Trey, for bringing that up. Ischemic would be the blockage. Hemorrhagic would be the like bleed out like a, a blood vessel burst and um, causing buildup of pressure from the blood in the brain. Um, it's the fourth most common cause of death in the US, major cause of long-term disability. Risk factors for that would be high blood pressure, tobacco, cardiac disease, and diabetes. PIA, um, there, there's um, some talk about a People are having multiple type TIAs. They could be at higher risk for having a bigger um, stroke episode or like a major stroke. But um, TIAs are just transient ischemic attacks. So people can have them and not necessarily have the major, uh, yeah, they can, like my, again, my grandma, I keep using my grandma who, she had, um, they, did an, um, they did a brain scan later on and, that she had all these areas in her brain where they're like, you must, you must have been having TIAs for like years. And she never knew, nothing sent her to the hospital where she thought she'd had a stroke. So, but um, it's a transient focal neurologic deficit that persists for less than 24 hours and is followed by complete 
clinical recovery. So somebody may, something may go weak, something may go limp, and then they recover. Um, you know, maybe they go to the doctor to be like, I think I'm having a stroke. And then it might be just a, a smaller, like a, a transient ischemic attack. Most TIAs do not last longer than 10 to 20 minutes. And generally the blood dissolves the blockage using its own anticoagulants in the blood. So like with my grandma, obviously the body was kind of getting her through it. Um, so the blockage is not placed long enough to cause permanent damage. But they could see scars on it on her brain scan. Yeah. My grandpa had a and um, Oh, really? Uh, yeah, he was talking about this when I had my first Oh. Um, he was like not being attentive. And he was like sitting at home, and my mom was, or my grandma was like watching him, and was like, this is not actually weird. This is not the thing. Like himself. Yeah. Like, really weird, and it's so minor. And it's yeah. So small. Like, there's like no way. Yeah. No way. Just take him back to the hospital. <laughs> Yeah, just like in case. The, the CBA specialist, like, come in, and maybe he's like, oh, he was having, like, a bunch of mini strokes, so, like, see. Now, did they, uh, did they, like, tell him to go, like, on low-dose aspirin or anything? I don't remember anything? what the treatment was, but they gave him, like, medication, like, there's yeah. no, like, lasting trauma yeah. from it at all. Like, but while like, it was happening. But while it was happening, he was literally just not being himself. He seemed grumpy. Yeah. Yeah. Because she was like, so there's a part of his brain that affects mood. Yeah, and, and it's just being yeah. like a little more irritable. Yeah, me, not the same. That's interesting. Um, okay, so this is just a little diagram that talks about what you might see if somebody does have a stroke, if the stroke happens on the right side of the brain, um, the different uh, things that can happen there. Um, some, of, some of the major differences would be, where is it? why there, I thought there was a couple things that stood out. Compared thought process, spatial or perceptual deficit. And then on the left side of the brain, language and speech, decreased auditory memory. Um, so that's just kind of interesting to compare. So if you have a patient that's had a stroke and is back in your chair, you can kind of see um, what maybe their, uh, where the deficit might be. And then um, here are some more, this is out of Darby um, and Walsh. So some motor, I won't read off all of this, but some motor impairment, some common deficits and what it might affect. And then their sensory impairment, you know, obviously they're, they could have some impairments with feeling and variations in temperature sensory, their vision, um, pain, they could have residual pain, language and cognition that could vary depending on the person and where the stroke happened in their in their brain and then depression or um, any kind of um, cognitive not cognitive but emotional um, changes too again that would depend on where the stroke happened in the brain so these are all just possible effects after a stroke. Um, treatment would be reducing risk factors they could be on anticoagulants or antihypertension low dose aspirin and then some therapies, physical and occupational therapies to help get them back into regular motor use. And then cerebral palsy uh, or cerebral vascular accident for oral manifestation. So um, again, it's going to depend on where the patient had um, the episode of the stroke and how severe they could have like Lisa Rowley, she has a, she had weakness for a long time, and she didn't feel like she had the same amount of dexterity. But now she, you know, is able to pretty much get back to normal. I think she probably would say that she still has a little bit of weakness. I think on her left side, but so you just have to take it case by case. You know, they could be considerably disabled, um, and you have to. Um, talk about their motor function and help, um, you know, they could be using a caregiver or it could just be some, just some weakness. And so then you just offer them, recommend electric toothbrush and increase their prevention for caries risk, have them rinse with some extra fluoride. So it could be something pretty simple or take a little bit more thought and critical thinking for how to help them. A patient who's had a stroke is at greater risk for having another one. Um, so prevention of a recurrence is um, the most important thing. 
Factors such as pain and anxiety add to the risk, um, just like with a patient with heart disease. Um, so that needs to be managed. And then efforts should be made to minimize um, kind of stressing them out or causing the anxiety, optimizing um, their energy levels. So morning appointments, keeping them short, like we say with a lot of things. Adaption for these patients um, for getting around in the office. So helping them in and out of the chair if um, they just need some assistance or coming down the hallway, making sure your pathways are cleared. So if they're using a walker or somebody's helping them, um, you have to think about all of those things. And um, six months, no elective dental care post-stroke. What was I just reading where it said three to six, three to six months? I think, is, but I thought it was something specifically with stroke where it actually said definitively three, but because I know with heart attack, yeah, the cardiovascular, sometimes they're like, and I think it's a lot of them, um, it depends on the doctor, you know, through, but I thought it was, maybe it could have been when we were reviewing the manual. Um, so yeah, so six months, no elective. So usually there's a pretty hard line there. Um, follow up the patient with um, those, just your questions, just like if they'd had a heart attack, um, when did you have the stroke? Um, how to manage pain and anxiety, you can kind of talk to them about that. Best way to minimize their fatigue and optimize their ability to get through the appointment, monitor their blood pressure. Um, infections uh, affect clotting factor and can trigger another DVA. So we just wanna make sure that our patients are healthy enough to be in our chair. So if they have had a recent stroke, usually you want to consult with their physician and just find out, you know, they're here. And then if they are a pretty periodontally compromised patient, you can add that to the conversation if you call the physician and you can say, you know, they, they need a pretty heavy duty cleaning. There's a lot of infection in their mouth. Is this anything that we should um, consider? Is there, you know, should they go on an anti coagulant while they come and have this work done, but then we have to think about excessive bleeding, right? So we just wanna make sure that all of um, those thoughts, all of those topics are kind of addressed with the physician. And then prophylactic medication, not likely um, unless there's something extra going on, um, but they typically wouldn't necessarily be on a pre-medication. And then minimize the use of local anesthetics with vasoconstrictor. But again, this is not a contraindication. It's just a caution. Um, usually we don't use more than two, um, two carpules anyways. Uh, and the vasoconstrictor, remember, it keeps the, the local anesthetic kind of in the area where we want it. So it helps with a lot of things, you know, because local anesthetic on its own is a vasodilator, and that can get the medication out of the area and you know through the circulatory system faster if we don't have that vasoconstrictor. So even though sometimes we feel like epinephrine with with you know patients that have different you know heart increased heart disease or stroke, we get nervous about it. But as long as we're being cautious and you know kind of um, not just pumping them full of it, usually uh, two is okay. You can also always ask the, their physician too if you're concerned about using it. Um, let me see if there's any other notes here. Patients may need to sort of relearn also, like, uh, you know, if they're in occupational therapy or in um, physical, well, occupational therapy, for sure, they may um, be working with them on things like toothbrushing and things like that, because that's kind of part of that. So if they're in sort of an OT um, therapy, they're going to be incorporating that anyways. And so you can kind of ask how that's going and how they're doing and see what you can do to help or be of service there. Um, let's see. I think these are um, just things that we already sort of have talked about, including the caregiver, writing instructions, assess motor skills, but this is all stuff that we've pretty much reviewed. Okay. And that is basically the end of it. That was kind of an abrupt ending. And then next week um, we'll do the exam and it'll cover all, all the topics that we 
discussed. And if we're going, if I'm going to throw in some questions on substance misuse, which I probably will like throw in a couple anyways, I'll just be sure to um, give you guys kind of an idea of what to focus on for those three. Likely, it would be something um, related to a, an oral manifestation. Yeah, 